Come on. All right, in uh, Revelation chapter 14, verses 6 to 20, the arrival of God's final judgment, which com completes the sweep of spiritual history that began in chapter 12. Well, the arrival of that final judgment is indicated by the message of three angels and the imagery of two harvests. In 14, chapter 14, verses 6 through 11, John hears the messages of three angels. The first angel proclaims the fact God's judgment has come, and with it, the time for his enemies throughout the world to pay forced homage. And the second angel announces the fall of Babylon, the center of Antichrist's empire. And the third angel warns of the eternal punishment of all who worship the beast and his image and receive the beast's mark. And then in verse 12 of chapter 14, it's a reminder that Christians must remain steadfast in obedience and faith, even in the face of the demands to worship the beast. The price of apostasy, the price of abandoning Jesus would be far greater than the temporary suffering that results from faithfulness. And then when we ended, we were looking at verse 13, where a voice from heaven tells John, write this, blessed are the dead who die in the Lord from now on. Blessed indeed, says the Spirit, that they may rest from their labors, for their deeds follow them. And as I said right at the end of last week, although faithfulness to Christ may result in martyrdom, many Christians throughout history have been martyred. Those who die in a state of spiritual union with Jesus Christ are blessed. They stand in sharp contrast to the pagans and the apostates, those who had abandoned Jesus. Now you note here it says that I heard a voice from heaven saying, blessed are the dead who die in the Lord from now on. Well, you need to be aware that that may not be the right way of understanding that. I won't go into the details, but as in David Allen's translation, this is a possible way of understanding the Greek text where he says, write this, blessed are the dead who die in the Lord, truly says the Spirit, that they may rest from their labors for their deeds, follow them. So from now on may not be the way to read the text, but if it is, if that's the right way to understand it, He's not saying that those before will not be blessed, will not receive that reward. He doesn't deny that there's the same reward for those who previously died. It's simply an allusion to the more active persecution that John anticipates. So he's saying, blessed are those who die in the Lord from now on, not saying that those who died before weren't blessed. But he's just arming them for this increased persecution that he's uh, focusing on. Now the Spirit, in the last part of verse 13, affirms emphatically the truth of the first part of verse 13. They will rest from the painful toil of this life, which toil includes the hardships of faithfulness. So here you are, you're struggling, you're getting the hammer, you're having a different... They will rest from the toil of this life because the fruit of their faithfulness, the manifestation of their faithfulness, their loyalty, the deeds that come through, those things will follow them. Death for faithful saints. Death for faithful saints is but a passage to unspeakable blessings. We have to hold on to that, and we have to know that. And that's what he's telling them. And then we see in 14, 14 to, uh, verses, chapter 14, verses 14 to 16, then I looked and behold, a white cloud and seated on the cloud, one like a son of man, with a golden crown on his head and a sharp sickle in his hand. And another angel came out of the temple, calling with a loud voice to him who sat on the cloud, Put in your sickle and reap, 
For the hour to reap has come, for the harvest of the earth is fully ripe. So he who sat on the clouds swung his sickle across the earth, and the earth was reaped. So John sees one like a son of man who's seated on a white cloud. He has a golden crown on his head and a sharp sickle in his hand. Now, there's some debate about the matter, but I'm with the majority of commentators. Okay, in this instance, I'm on the majority side. I'm with the majority of commentators in thinking that this refers to the Lord Jesus Christ. In chapter 1, verse 13, one like a son of man refers unequivocally to Jesus. And the background for this imagery is Daniel chapter 7, verse 13. And that verse had rightly come to be associated with the Messiah under the title Son of Man. And the other allusions in Revelation to Daniel chapter 7, verse 13, they clearly refer to Jesus. You see in chapter 1, verse 7 and chapter 1, verse 13. And indeed, Jesus used the same Daniel Son of Man imagery, that chapter 7, verse 13 imagery, in referring to his return in judgment in Matthew chapter 24, verse 30. Now that he's seated on the white cloud, that may be an echo of Joel chapter 3, verse 12, which speaks of God sitting to judge the nations. And the gold crown or wreath that is on his head, that's a victor's crown. So it may symbolize Christ's victory, which victory is most fully expressed at his return. But there also may be another dimension to it because Roman emperors would sometimes wear wreaths as symbols of victory. So it's possible, especially with the uh, allusion to Daniel chapter 7 verse 13, that you kind of have a merging here of victory and sovereignty. So both elements of, you know, victory and then royalty and sovereignty and rule could all be indicated by that golden wreath. And the sickle in his hand, that's a symbol, as it is in Mark chapter 4, verse 29, of reaping at the final harvest, reaping at the final judgment. And its sharpness indicates its effectiveness for that task. Okay, it's so very effective for this final judgment, for reaping at this final harvest. And then the statement in verse 15 that another angel came out of the temple is not meant to suggest that one like a son of man was an angel. In other words, it's not a comparison like he comes out and then another angel. He was an angel, here's another angel. No, he's talking about he sees yet another angel in addition to the many angels who have already appeared in the vision. So he's not contrasting it with Jesus. He's an angel and there's yet another one. I think that would be a clear mistake to understand it that way. This one comes from the heavenly temple, meaning that this angel he sees comes from the immediate presence of God and he calls out to the Lord Jesus Christ and he says, put in your sickle and reap for the hour to reap has come for the harvest of the earth is fully ripe. Now the angel is not an authority over Jesus. He's not bossing Jesus around. The angel is simply, from where he came, he's simply delivering the message of God the Father who alone knows the time of the final judgment. He is delivering that message, giving him the command to begin the harvest. It's time. Okay, so he comes from God, delivers that message to the Son that now is time for the reaping to begin. Time for that. And Jesus, he harvests the earth at God's appointed hour when the earth is fully ripe. It's time now for the judgment. And this harvest may symbolize, this harvest that he's talking about here may symbolize the positive side of the judgment. Okay, this may symbolize the gathering of the righteous 
the faithful at the return of Jesus. And in that case, Christ being the reaper, that may signify his close connection with the redeemed. So this may be focusing on the redeemed who are then brought in. In the New Testament, the figure of a harvest, it's normally, not always, but it's normally used of the gathering of people into the kingdom of God. And you can see that in Matthew 9, 37 and 38, Mark 4, 29, Luke 10, 2, John 4, 35 to 38. And in this harvest, unlike the harvest we're going to see in the next few verses, uh, 17 to 20, there's no indication of God's wrath or rejection. Okay, so it's, it's quite possible that this is the harvest and the bringing in of the redeemed, okay? But others think, no, that's not the right way to see this, that this is referring to the general uh, judgment, okay? This is referring to, a, a, it's a general picture of the coming judgment that includes the recompense of both the good and the bad, the redeemed and the lost, as pictured in Matthew chapter 13, verse 30, and Matthew chapter 13, verse 39. And Jesus could be pictured in Revelation 14, 16 as the one reaping instead of the angels reaping, as it is in Matthew 13, 39, to indicate that he stands behind the angels' activity. So you could see it that way, that he's pictured as reaping instead of the angels being uh, pictured as reaping because he stands behind their activity. So there are those who think, no, what he's talking about here is the general resurrection that extends and in, in, involves both the redeemed and the unsaved. And then when you go to the next few verses in 17 to 20 from the general that encompasses both groups, we then narrow the focus to the unsaved. Okay, so really the, the question is, and I don't consider it a really significant question because I don't think it changes how you understand things, but the question is whether the first scene, does it focus on the fate of the redeemed who, is, who are pictured as being received by God, and then the scene focuses in 17 to 20 to the unsaved being rejected by God. So do we have a harvest of the redeemed, and then do we have a focus on the lost? Or do we have a general picture that involves both the saved and the lost, and then we narrow the focus to the lost? Okay, as I say, I don't think it really matters much, but that's a discussion and a debate that goes on. Uh, so that, that's what, what happened. Now in 17 to 20, so we're clearly now getting, you'll see a different tone here in 17 to 20. It says, then another angel came out of the temple in heaven, and he too had a sharp sickle. And another angel came out from the altar, the angel who has authority over the fire. And he called with a loud voice to the one who had the sharp sickle, put in your sickle and gather the clusters from the vine of the earth, for its grapes are ripe. So the angel swung his sickle across the earth and gathered the grape harvest of the earth and threw it into the great winepress of the wrath of God. And the winepress was trodden outside the city and blood flowed from the winepress as high as a horse's bridle for 1,600 stadia. Now, still another angel comes from the temple in heaven, and he too has a sharp sickle. And then another angel with authority over the fire comes. He comes from the altar, and he commands the angel with the sickle to harvest the grapes because they are ripe. In other words, the time is has come. And the angel who comes from the altar, that may be the angel that we saw in chapter 8, verses 3 through 5, who filled his censer with fire from the altar and then hurled it to the earth. But even if it's a different angel, the fact he comes from the altar, that may suggest a connection between the prayers of the saints and God's final judgment. And the angel, God's agent of wrath, harvests the grapes from the earth. 
And then he cast those grapes into the great wine press of God's wrath. Now, treading grapes, right? You, you get these grapes, you put them in, and you go stomp all over them, right? You're making wine, and you're treading on these grapes. And that was a familiar, a familiar figure for the execution of divine wrath against his enemies. You see that, for example, in Isaiah chapter 63, verse 3, Lamentations, chapter 1, verse 15, Joel, chapter 3, verse 13. And that the wine press is trodden outside the city. That's a symbol of the absolute rejection, the eternal banishment of the damned from God. That's what's being symbolized there. They will have no part in the city of God. They will be excluded. And the completeness and horror of the judgment is depicted by the amount of blood flowing from the wine press. It's just really something. It flowed as high as a horse's bridle for a distance of 1,600 stadia, which converts to about 184 miles. Now, this is a lot of blood flowing out of this wine press. And that distance, that 1,600 stadia, it may be symbolic. It may be derived from the fact that 40 was a traditional number of punishment. You see, for example, in Numbers chapter 14, verse 33, Israel's 40 years in the desert. Deuteronomy 25, verse 3, 40 lashes are given to a criminal for punishment. And 1,600 is 40 squared. So that may be what's behind it there. Now, there are others who think there is some other symbolic significance to the 1,600. And there are others who think, no, it's not really symbolic significance. It's simply a hyperbolic image emphasizing the exceptional nature of the slaughter. But it seems to me there's something to that 40 uh, idea. Now, in Revelation chapter 19, verse 15, Jesus is the one who treads the winepress of the fury of God's wrath. Jesus is the one who treads it. Okay, so this idea that, you know, our aversion to the truth of God's judgment just really irks me. Okay, it says, though we have to apologize for who God is, He is who He is, brothers and sisters, and the judgment is part of His nature as sure as I'm standing here. And it will not be pretty, and the damned will be eternally punished. And I do nobody any favors by trying to soft sell that. No, 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 no. That's not part of who God is. It is. Okay? It is. Jesus is the one who's treading the wine press of the fury of God's wrath. And part of the imagery there in Revelation chapter 19, drawn from Isaiah chapter 63 verses 1 to 6, is that his robe, Jesus' robe, is dipped in blood. He's soaked. He's soaked in the blood of his enemies trodden in the wine press. Okay? So this is the idea. The, the more and more we say, no, no, no. You know, God is too loving to actually judge anybody. We feed this notion in our society that the judgment of God is no big deal. You don't have to worry about anything about coming up against a loving God. He, in the end, is ultimately going to say, that's okay, you know I'm a sweetheart. Right? Isn't that the picture we want to, to generate among, with people? Instead of saying, no, he, he's absolutely loving. He loves you to die for you. But he's going to judge. And the judgment is not going to be something that you will take casually. And I want you to know that. I don't want to mislead you. Give you some false picture. I trust God knows how to reveal himself. And I'm going to tell you that. 
And there you have it. And that's the, that's the picture that you have there. Now, in chapters 15 to 16, we get details of the wrath accompanying the sounding of the seventh trumpet. Now, you remember that the, the final judgment of God, the fire thrown down to earth, hurled to the earth by the angel in chapter 8, verse 5, that is symbolized, that final judgment is symbolized in the punishments meted out in the sounding of the seven trumpets. They're not seven separate judgments, but they are the portrayal of one final judgment as a sevenfold judgment. Seven being the number of perfection or completeness. And you'll recall that the first woe that accompanied the sounding of the fifth trumpet was described in detail as this terrible assault of demonic locusts that tormented people. And the second woe that accompanied the sounding of the sixth trumpet was likewise described in detail as the vast horde of demonic horsemen who slaughtered people as it swept across the earth. But the third woe of the seventh trumpet that was sounded in chapter 11, it wasn't described. So we have these detailed descriptions of the first woe, of the second woe. We're waiting for the third and final woe of the seventh trumpet, seventh trumpet sound. We don't get a description. We don't get a description of it. Instead, as I've said, the vision jumps to a time after the outpouring of God's wrath is completed to the eternal state. It hops over that final wrath. We go to the eternal state, a time when God's wrath and the judging of the dead had already occurred. So we jump over that. Now, with a number of commentators... I think that the seven bowls of wrath that we're going to see introduced here in chapter 15 are the delayed description of the third woe of the seventh trumpet. And I read you this, this quote before. This is from Wist Fanning. It says, with the trumpet blast from the seventh angel, the, uh, the series of trumpets that began in 8, 2 to 7 is completed, but just as the opening of the seventh seal in 8, 1 signaled no immediate judgments, unlike the first six seals, so no explicit judgments follow the seventh trumpet blast. Instead, the seven bowls that eventually follow in chapters 15 and 16 will fill out the judgments of the seventh trumpet as the seven trumpets fill out the seventh seal. And I think that's right. You see, according to chapter 10, verse 7, when the seventh trumpet is sounded, chapter 10, verse 7 says, the mystery of God will be fulfilled, as he announced to the prophets. And in keeping with that, we see in chapter 11, verses 15 to 18, that the sounding of the seventh trumpet then brings us to the consummated kingdom, to the eternal state, which includes, you see, the judgment that necessarily was poured out prior to the finalization of the kingdom. Because in the kingdom, all the wrath has been poured out in the eternal state. So when we jump to that, we are saying that the seventh trumpet included the final outpouring of God's wrath. And then it's clear in chapter 15, verse 1 and 16, 7, that the plagues of the seven bowls complete the outpouring of God's wrath. And since the seventh trumpet includes the completion of God's wrath, it seems that these punishments of the seven bowls, they are the unreported third woe that accompanies the sounding of of the seventh trumpet. As the final woe of the final trumpet, it's magnified through its own series of seven, these seven bowls. Okay, chapter 15, verses 1 to 8. Then I saw another sign in heaven, great and amazing. Seven angels 
with seven plagues, which are the last, for with them the wrath of God is finished. And I saw what appeared to be a sea of glass mingled with fire, and also those who had conquered the beast and its image and the number of its name, standing beside the sea of glass, having harps of God. Now, you see, I modified the English Standard Version. I'm going to tell you why I did that. I think they mistakenly, they, they, they misunderstand something, okay? But having harps of God. And they sing the song of Moses, the servant of God, and the song of the Lamb, saying, Great and amazing are your deeds, O Lord God the Almighty. Just and true are your ways, O King of the nations. You see, there, there's no apprehensiveness about God's judgment. There's glory and celebration of God's judgment for what it reveals about who He is, His righteousness, His power, His glory. There's the, people are, the, the angelic beings, they're not intimidated by it. He goes on, O King of the nations, who will not fear, O Lord, and glorify your name? For you alone are holy. All nations will come and worship you for your righteous acts or judgments. Your judgments have been revealed. After this I looked and the sanctuary of the tent of witness in heaven was opened. And out of the sanctuary came the seven angels with the seven plagues clothed in pure bright linen with golden sashes around their chest. And one of the four living creatures gave to the seven angels seven golden bowls full of the wrath of God who lives forever and ever. And the sanctuary was filled with smoke from the glory of God and from His power. And no one could enter the sanctuary until the seven plagues of the seven angels were finished. So John sees a great and amazing sign in heaven. Seven angels with the last seven plagues that complete the wrath of God. And the emphasis is on God's bringing history to a close. History has been moving in a God-ordained direction ever since the fall. He has been taking this damaged creation, this spoiled, sin-sick creation, in the direction he has determined. And so what he's seeing here in the outpouring of the final wrath of God, he's seeing the finalization of God's eternal vision. And so it is, in fact, a great and amazing thing to see. In chapter 7, the faithful... They're assured of their future glory before the depiction of the final judgment that begins with the trumpets in chapter 8. In chapter 14, verses 1 to 5, they're assured of their future glory before the final judgment that is summarized. In chapter 14, verses 6 to 20. And here in chapter 15, verses 2 to 4, they're assured of the joy and the blessing of faithfulness prior to the completion of God's wrath that is symbolized in the outpouring of the seven bowls. So you see this pattern where there's reassurance, judgment, reassurance, judgment, reassurance, judgment. And you see it happening here. And in verses 2 to 4, he sees the faithful represented by those who expressed their faith. The faithful represented by those who express their faith in the extreme circumstance of the final generation. He sees them standing on what looked like a sea of glass mixed with fire. In chapter 4, verse 6, the sea of glass like crystal, that was before the throne of God. And the imagery depicts the majesty and the brilliance of God. And the mention of fire here, he sees it mixed with fire. That may be an, an allusion to God's judgment. That's what may be happening there because uh, judgment is often portrayed in terms of fire. And this great picture, it again reinforces, yet again it reinforces the truth that the blessings of faithfulness, the blessings in store for the faithful are worth any price. If I could put that in your heart, 
I'd give anything to do it. That they are worth any price. It is imagery of the concept expressed by the Apostle Paul in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 16 to 18. Therefore, we do not lose heart, but even if our outward man is being wasted away, yet our inward man is being renewed day by day. For the lightness of our affliction, which is momentary, you know Paul's life, they beat him all over the Mediterranean. The lightness of our affliction, which is momentary, is producing for us far beyond all measure an eternal weight of glory as we focus not on the things that are seen, but on the things that are not seen. For the things that are seen are temporary, but the things that are not seen are eternal. I'm thinking eternity, baby. I have my eye on the eternal state. And that far exceeds what I'm facing here. Now, the victorious saints... They are described simply as having harps of God. You Greek scholars can check me on that. That's how it's rendered in the American Standard Version, the English Revised Version, the New King James, World English Bible. And if you know Greek, you can just go look. Okay? It simply says having harps of God. The text doesn't say anything about hands. Okay? doesn't say anything about that. Them holding them or them being in their hands. Those, though many translations do that, I know that. But those are interpretive glosses based on the assumption that harps of God refer to an image of an external instrument that has either come from God or is to be used for God. Okay, so that's the harps of God. I'm assuming in harps of God that it's referring to an external instrument, an instrument external to my body. And therefore, if that's the case, well, then I'm going to take the word echo, which can mean to have or to hold. I'm going to take it as hold because it's something external. And if I'm going to take it as hold, well, I'm going to add the gloss in their hands because that's where you'd be holding them. I just think that's a mistake. I don't think that's the right way to understand it. The word echo can mean having, it can mean holding something, but it also can mean having in the sense of being equipped with. Okay, it is often used of, pers of a person having hands, feet, eyes, ears. And though imagery of external harps along with bowls of incense, that imagery of external harps was in fact used in chapter 5, verse 8, as static symbols of prayers. It was used there. Those harps are not called harps of God. They're simply called harps, like harps we know. So there's an image there, whether you have these external harps, that there are static symbols of prayers, but they are not called harps of God. And I think the qualification, harps of God, is important. I think it's indicating something to us that these aren't just typical harps. There's something else going on. These are harps of God. And I think, and I feel pretty strongly about it, that it's a metaphorical reference to the internal instrumentation, the larynx, tongue, and mouth that produce vocal sounds. Indeed, voices, just a chapter before, voices were said in chapter 14, verse 2, to be like, like the sound of harpists playing their harps. So already the voice has been analogized. The singing voice has been analogized to a harp. It is the human voice consecrated to God in the expression of praise. I submit to you that is God's harp. The instrument that is uniquely suited for the worship of a God who is spirit. The voice is the immediate and ultimate expression of the inner man, of the human spirit, which when under the influence of the Holy Spirit is beautiful and pleasing to God. Now the renowned church historian Everett Ferguson 
He says, vocal expressions are peculiarly well suited to the expression of spiritual worship, to the expressing of what comes from the human spirit through the spirit. It is the most immediate expression of who we are, right? That's how I, 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 I speak. I sing. You see, he says, they are rational, not in the sense of non-emotional, but as proceeding from and appealing to the highest of human nature. The whole self, including the emotions, is involved in Christian worship, but the mind, reason, is to be in control. Instrumental music can express feelings and emotions. Vocal music can express the will and intellect. The latter is better suited for the communion of spirit with spirit. In vocal music, there's an immediate contact. In instrumental music, there's an intermediary. The voice is much more a matter of oneself than any other gift of praise can be. Vocal music thus best corresponds to the nature of one's relationship to God. Now, certainly such a metaphorical reference would not be out of place in apocalyptic literature like Revelation. And in fact, just a century after Revelation was written, Clement of Alexandria, he described the tongue as the psaltery of the spirit. Psaltery was, an, was a stringed box-like instrument, something like a harp. So he calls the tongue the psaltery of the spirit, and he said the cathara, the harp, the very word here, he says that the harp was, quote, the mouth struck by the spirit as it were by a plectrum. So he says, well, what is the harp? The harp is the mouth that the spirit is plucking like with a guitar pick. So that's it. So you see, so it's not odd to say that this is God's harp. You are equipped with God's harp. That's what I think is going on there. Now, in addition, there's no mention of the external harps being played, right? There's no mention of external harps being played. The text merely reports that those having God's harps are singing. Right? And I say 14.2, it says their voices are what? They're like the sounds of harpists playing their harps. Okay, so you, you see that there. Now, given the persuasive, I say overwhelming, evidence that the early church did not use instruments in worship for centuries. If you doubt me on it, I've written about it. Go look at them. Okay, I got maybe 50 pages for you. Uh, and you can go, it all documented for you. Okay, maybe 900 years. And given that environment, you see, and the church also recognized that the voice was the instrument best suited for worshiping a God who is spirit. So in that context, in a book like Revelation, the church and the people receiving this, they would be primed to understand God's harps as a metaphor for the singing capacity of spirit filled Christians. Okay? There you have it. I think that's how to understand that. People disagree, but I tell you what I think. Okay, they're singing the song of Moses and the song of the Lamb. Now, this is probably, it's one song with a double title. It's a song of praise for God's deliverance. Praising Him for having rescued us. It's a deliverance that was made possible by God's sovereignty, by God's absolute rulership. The deliverance of which Moses and the people sang in Exodus chapter 15, verses 1 to 18, that prefigured the greater deliverance brought about by the Lamb. Now, God is so great that ultimately, Every nation will fear and glorify him, acknowledging his sovereignty, acknowledging his unique holiness and his absolute power. The promise of texts like Psalm 86 verse 9, that all nations will come and worship him is now fulfilled because his judgments 
And I think that's probably the better way. Righteous acts, judgment is a righteous act. But I think the focus here is on judgment, as in the King James Revised Standard, New King James, New Revised Standard. I think he's talking about the judgments here have been revealed. That is why they're coming. Because the time for judgment has fallen. In other words, all nations, whether eagerly or under compulsion, whether happily or unhappily, will give God his due when his righteous judgment falls on the earth. Even the rebellious will bow down, bend the knee in the language of of Philippians chapter 2, in enforced acceptance of the reality of God's glory. And this word that's used here, this word worship, it can be used for bowing and kneeling before another, even if one doesn't have the heart. So when he says it's going to be worship that is mandated, that I'm overpowering you, that you're going to give me worship. You're thinking, well, it's not really worship. No, th- this idea of, of you're giving me worship involuntarily, I made you give me worship. You see, it can reflect this, this bending down and bowing down and acknowledging the power of the one. And you can see it, for example, in Mark 15, 19, where those mocking Jesus are said to what? To be worshiping him. You, you go, we're not worshiping. No, you get what, what he's talking about, right? There, there's going to be a forced worship by the rebel. Now, we're going to be going, yeah! Right? I mean, we're going to be, but there's, there's not going to be anybody who's going to be standing out going, you can't make me bow. You can't do it. Oh, no, he's going to do it. <laughs> he's going to do it. You see, and that's the point that he's making here. Now, the temple or sanctuary in heaven, it's referred to in verse 5 as the, the tent or the tabernacle of testimony or the tent of witness. Now, the tabernacle... In Israel's early history, it was called the tabernacle of testimony or the tent of witness or tabernacle of witness because it housed the Ark of the Covenant, which in turn held God's testimony in the form of the stone tablets on which the Ten Commandments were written. And you can see that in Exodus 32, 15 and 16, 34, 28, Deuteronomy 10, 5, and I think this is a reference to this is a reference to God as the source and standard of mankind's moral obligation and thus it is a reference to him as the one who judges sin. That's what I think is implicit in this picture now where it's called the tent of witness and seven angels emerge from the heavenly temple wearing pure bright linen and golden sashes around their chest. And they're coming from the temple. That's indicative of the divine origin of their commission. They are agents of God and their appearance symbolizes their purity and their importance in bringing this about. And one of the four living creatures, one of the four living creatures gives a golden bowl that's the first bell, right? Yes. Is it? Oh, you see, when you get old, you can't hear anything. So I can use that. I'm claiming that's the first bell. Yeah. <laughs> All right. There you go. Uh, Lord willing, next week. <laughs> <laughs>